Hey everyone, this is Stacey Lindis from Podcast PD, a proud member of the Education Podcast Network, just like the show you're listening to right now. The opinions expressed are those of the individual host. Make sure you check out all of the other great podcasts at edupodcastnetwork.com and get ready because the learning begins in three, two, one. Coming up on episode number 131 of the House of EdTech podcast, I'm going to be reflecting on EdTech in my actual classroom. I've got an EdTech thought where I'm going to talk about the satire and downfall of Twitter for Education. I've got a recommendation for a cool website builder for teachers and students. And I've got another installment of Just Give It a Try. Let's strike up the band. Welcome to the House of Ed Tech podcast. I am your host, Chris Nessie. The House of Ed Tech explores how technology is changing the way teachers teach and the impact that technology is having in education. I discuss technology that is changing our classrooms and schools, and I share tools and tips that you can hear today and use tomorrow. You're going to hear the stories of teachers, leaders, and creators just like you. The purpose? Whether you use it or not, technology is changing the way you teach and how your students learn. Hey, hey, hey. Welcome back inside the House of EdTech podcast. I am so glad you're here. If you're a new listener, thank you for checking out this podcast. And I hope that by the end of this episode, I will earn your subscription. If you're a returning listener, thanks for coming back. I'm so glad that you make this podcast a part of your anytime, anywhere professional development. I am very excited because it is the end of April. Spring is in the air here in New Jersey. And for the first time in many months, I'm recording here in the studio and the window is open. I, I love when I feel the breeze come into the studio. Perhaps you're in your car. Maybe you can crack the window and feel the breeze right along with me. Let's get to something very important here at the top of the show. I want to give a shout out to the Dads and Ed podcast. The guys posted their final episode earlier this month in April 2019. I want to give a sincere thank you to Josh, Devin, and Brent for all of the great content that you guys put out into the world, especially episode 42. I'm going to miss you guys. I really enjoyed getting new Dads and Ed episodes. I enjoyed having you guys being a part of the Education Podcast Network, and I wish you guys the best of luck in whatever content you guys create next. Craig Nansen, at C. Nansen, reached out to me on Twitter, and he shared a video that he made about some lesser-known features of OneTab. I checked out the video. It's totally worth it, and I will be sure to include the video link in the show notes for this episode out at chrisnessy.com slash 131. So if one tab is your jam, or maybe if it's not, go check out this video from Craig. And thank you, Craig, for connecting on Twitter and sharing this little bit of content with me that I can now share with the whole community. Big news, everybody. I am going to ISTE. Sort of. I will be in the city of Philadelphia on Sunday, June 23rd. And I was fortunate enough to secure some media credentials. Why only Sunday the 23rd? Well, I teach in New Jersey, and I teach in a district where there was some snow this year. My last day of school is Thursday, June 27th. While everybody is enjoying all that ISTE has to offer on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, I will still be in school, doing my thing, finishing up the school year. But I can use the credentials on Sunday the 23rd. I put this out to you. One, maybe you're going to also be in Philadelphia for ISTE 2019 in Philly. If you're going to be there in Philadelphia on Sunday, June 23rd, I want to meet you. I'm interested in organizing a meetup of the House of Ed Tech podcast PD. Stacy's going to be in Philly on Sunday. We're trying to get AJ to be there. Uh, there will also be some other members of the Education Podcast Network. I'm trying behind the scenes to organize some sort of meetup and would love for you to be a part of it. So if you're going to be in Philly on Sunday, June 23rd, please email me. Send that email over to feedback at chrisnessy.com or give me a shout out on Twitter at 
Mr. Nessie, and let me know so that way I can determine how many cheesesteaks we're going to need. For this episode's EdTech Thought, I've called it the satire and downfall of Twitter for Education. There are a number of Twitter accounts that I've come across that are trying to put a lot of honest thoughts into the world. These are the types of accounts that if you read them, you will certainly laugh, and you might also think, hey, that is so true. They are also run by anonymous people, as far as I can tell. One account is dedicated to exposing education frauds, while another is using a virtual stick to poke the well-known education thought leaders of the world. Now, I look at these accounts from time to time, and I read the tweets, and I think, yes, thank you for again pointing out that the person claiming they have a high-ranking education job is full of crap. Or, you know people do put an awful lot of stock in the opinion of someone who hasn't taught in 15 years. Or, the underlying tone of some people's tweets is to advance their own status or the products that they sell. But why do I bring this up? Because maybe you've seen accounts like this and find humor in this type of content too. When I really get to the core, what I'm seeing is pushback. I see envy and I see negativity. I think much of Twitter for education is a vacuum. This coming from somebody who is very much inside of this vacuum. A year or two ago, I did an EdTech thought on the idea of the hashtag edufail. It didn't go anywhere. We inherently don't want to put our failure or missteps into the world. We don't want to be criticized. But these satirical accounts are being critical, and I'll be honest, I think they're doing it appropriately so. We all see the same Twitter chat questions week after week, chat after chat. I mean, hashtag podcast PD was one of the first chats to put its questions out as images to skirt the former 140 character limit. Now every chat drops images. We see chats that started around one topic delve into other topics that I don't always see how the weekly chat topic relates to the larger topic of the hashtag. Just because, let's say, the king of slides speaks to us from on high doesn't mean we can't be critical and have a differing opinion on the use of overhead projectors on a Friday afternoon. The tough thing is that the far majority of educators have integrity, and they hold their profession on a pedestal. We dare not put something out on Twitter that might rock the boat or present a negative point of view. I've dabbled in the dark art of honesty on Twitter, and it doesn't get the response you think it does. It's like real life. People look for a second, if at all, and then they turn their attention back to themselves. Unless you're tweeting out thoughts of the day. I debated whether or not to mention specific users, but what the hell. If you want to see some of these accounts, go check out at exposed fraud underscore two. X-P-O-S-D-P-H-R-A-U-D underscore T-O-O. Ed Thought Leader or Robert Dewey. R-O-B-B-E-R-T-D-E-W-E-Y. They should give you a laugh, but they should also give you pause. And that's my EdTech thought. For this episode's EdTech recommendation, I'd like to recommend imcreator.com. That's I M C R E A T O R.com. This website allows you to design, build, and publish for free a website. Plus, you get unlimited hosting with unlimited bandwidth. They think everyone should be able to build their own site, and they're proud to provide a fair website maker. Creating a website with I M Creator is simple, fast, and intuitive. And I would shout out the one specific student on a recent project who used this, but I can't give out their name. But I came across this site from a student in one of my classes. They make it simple. Anyone can create a website in a matter of minutes. 
using their industry-leading editor, and you don't need to know any coding. Any content you add will be responsive and will naturally adjust itself to any device, laptop, tablet, phone, even a wearable like a smartwatch or an Oculus. Building a website with IM Creator is kind of like playing with Lego. You can start with any preset, add blocks from other sets, and customize everything until you have your dream website. You can build a one-pager or a 1,000-pager. Their system has been used to build the largest news websites in the world, as well as the simplest landing pages, so your growth is unlimited. The clean layouts, animation effects, and responsive visuals available in their templates are sure to leave an impression on your users. All of their templates are designed by experienced professional web designers. And they offer free, premium, and commercial accounts. The free account offers unlimited hosting. You can connect your own domain. You get access to all the themes. And they're ad-free. So if you're looking for a way to have a teacher website, or a way to have your students create websites or maybe build digital portfolios, give this a shot and go to imcreator.com. For today's featured content, I simply want to share a story of a recent lesson that I designed and used in my high school social studies classroom. So since returning to the social studies classroom in 2016, after a five-year stint running the in-school suspension program in my school, I've put a lot of pressure on myself to put my money where my mouth is in terms of how I, the host of the House of EdTech podcast, use technology in the classroom. I love EdTech as you know, but I'm going to be honest and share that I also struggle with integration. Yes, using technology isn't difficult, and Lord knows I try many tools with the hopes of helping my students grow. It doesn't always work, and it doesn't always go smoothly. Recently, as my students were completing our unit on the study of World War I, I knew that between state testing here in New Jersey and my school's spring break, I would have time to cover the interwar years. Now, if you're not a history person, that's the 20-year period from 1919 to 1939 between World War I and World War II. Since my classes are block scheduled, I was working with a two-day window. I designed something that was part web quest and part creative project with some infusion of technology. For the first day, I created a simple Google site using new Google Sites that provided my students with some information about the interwar years and I designed four activities for them to complete on their own or in groups of up to four people. The activities were as follows. Number one, to read an overview of this 20-year period and also read one article about a subtopic of the same time period. And I simply curated this content from SparkNotes. The second activity was to simply listen to 15 minutes of music from the 1920s and 30s. I found a YouTube video that was over two hours long and simply asked my students, choose any 15 minutes in one chunk, or you can skip around, but listen to about 15 minutes of this music of the 1920s and 30s. I actually thought it was pretty humorous when the first class I had that did this, a couple of kids raised their hand and said, hey, Mr. Nessie, this music sounds like it's from Tom and Jerry. So I continued to use that when kids initially groaned about having to listen to music that wasn't made yesterday. <laughs> the third activity was to watch a short video and provide a little bit of analysis about this video that was about 11 and a half minutes and was an overview of the same time period. Again, the interwar years. And the fourth activity was to analyze three political cartoons from the time period. My students really enjoyed listening to the music, as I said previously. And again, they were given a two-hour video on YouTube, and all they had to do was choose 15 minutes and listen to that. They really enjoyed this. They also enjoyed the short video clip that was again about 11 and a half minutes or so. The first roadblock, this came up when I attempted to access the source I had curated at home for finding political cartoons for them to analyze. I found this awesome website at home, and when I got to school, it was blocked for students. Super frustrating in the moment. So together with my students, we crafted a few Google search options that allow them to find appropriate political cartoons to use 
for analysis, and they used a graphic organizer that I had linked on the Google site that I created. So we got around that issue. Each of these four activities, I designed them thinking each one should take about 15 minutes. So I, I intentionally found a video that was less than 15 minutes to give an overview of this time period. And with the music of the 1920s and 30s, I intentionally said only listen to 15 minutes of the music. I needed my students to pick up some background information and move on to the creative portion. So again, this was giving my students control of the content, giving them choice in the articles that they read from what I had curated. So that's what I was asking them to do. The creative piece of this was me asking them to create fake Snapchat images. I wanted them to use a website called remove.bg, B as in boy, G as in girl, and this is an amazing site for educational and personal use. And all it does, you upload an image and it removes the background from a photo. I then wanted them to also use Google Drawings and a website called generatestatus.com for generating faux statuses for Twitter, Snapchat, Instagram, all sorts of different social media platforms. You name it, they got it. And again, as written, the assignment asked them to create two to five images where they added a picture of themselves to a historic photo and to then make that photo look like it was posted on Snapchat if Snapchat existed in the 1920s and 30s. It took about 10 minutes for me to demonstrate this whole process to my students. I had randomly selected a student from each class, and in advance of my demo, I had them pose for a photo, and then I quickly explained what I would be doing with it to that one student. So they were all cool with it. I walked them through taking a photo on their phones, so I used mine, and emailing it to themselves. So I took a photo on my phone, emailed it to myself, and then I demonstrated, you know, downloading it and where they had to navigate. And now this added the next wrinkle as their school accounts don't receive emails from outside domains. So I had all these kids buy into this activity and then they couldn't send the pictures to themselves. So how do we get around this? We got around it by having students who had their school emails on their phones take the photos of those who didn't. And for others, I had them install the Google Drive app on their phone and then upload their photos to their drive after logging in with their school credentials. And then they could access the photos that they took on their Chromebooks. The next step was to create a new Google drawing and resize the canvas to the correct size for uploading a portrait style photo to Snapchat as if we were doing it for real. So I wanted this to be as authentic as possible. The students could Google search for an interwar year image within drawings or in a new tab. I recommended that they do it from within the Google drawings interface because it's right there. Then they don't have to really download and upload any more than they already had to. After finding an appropriate image, they uploaded the picture of themselves to the website remove.bg, which again removes the background from a photo, and again, really well. Then they had to download their pic and upload it to the Google Drawings. The final steps were to grayscale the image of themselves and ultimately download the file, the final image and upload it to the website generatestatus.com which allowed them to create a faux Snapchat image where they could add a Snapchat style caption and download the final image and ultimately upload it to Google Classroom and attach it to this assignment. I initially set out asking my students to create five to seven of these types of images and something that took me but a few minutes proved to be challenging for my students. So I wound up modifying it to two and that worked out much better. They weren't stressed out. And I'd say about 90% of them were able to complete it. Those that couldn't, simply it came down to they were trying to get too cute and creative with it. So I wasn't going to stifle their creativity or cuteness. So they're going to finish these images over the spring break. Most students enjoyed this and really got into trying to pose for a picture that they could make blend into an existing photo. They used chairs, tables, and additional tools within Google Drawings to get creative. I even had one student who put themselves on what looked like the deck of a boat, like a ship, with other people, and they used the drawing tools to put the railing over them. And for a second, I thought, how did you get... I, I didn't know how they did it. And then they explained it, and I was like, that's really cool and really creative. Was this two days effective? 
I'm honestly not sure. Will they remember information about the interwar years for the rest of their lives? Probably not. I think the biggest takeaways will be removing the background from a photo and putting one picture into another and getting the chance to be creative. And I think that's okay. Upon further reflection, I spoke with my in-class support teacher, and we both agreed that this would probably be a really great activity for the beginning of a school year, where we could ask students to choose a topic from the curriculum that we will cover, and then find an image of a topic that they're interested in, and create this type of picture that we could print and display in the classroom, and really start to build the tech-centric classroom that I provide by giving something that is multi-step and uses more than one app. I don't know how it's going to go, but I will certainly let you know how it goes when I try this in the next school year. Love to know what you think of this lesson, the tools that I used, and I would love your feedback. If you have any suggestions, or if you've done something similar, please let me know. You can let me know on Twitter, or you can also go to chrisnessy.com slash 131 and leave a comment on the show notes, or you can go to chrisnessy.com slash feedback, and there's a number of ways that you can get in touch with me there. And now it's time for another installment of Just Give It a Try. This is where, for many episodes, I tell you, using technology isn't difficult, just give it a try. So I set up a Flipgrid to let you tell me your story of things you've tried. And I'm going to share them here on the podcast. So we have two installments this week. One comes to us from Flipgrid, the other by old-fashioned email. So let's take up the Flipgrid cause and take it away, Mr. G. Hello, House of EdTech. This is Mr. G. And today I want to tell you about Flipgrid. I'm sure most of you already know about it. But the thing is that I wanted to try to give my students a voice. And Flipgrid worked wonderfully. Except some of my students still felt that their voice was not being heard. So that's when I started podcasting. One of my students wanted to talk about things that normally were not allowed in class. And with their own podcast, they were able to talk about topics that are normally not heard. And they were able to share it with the world. So I was able to give my students a genuine voice. So yes, Flipgrid, great, and podcasting as well. I'm Mr. G. Cheers. Thank you for sending that in, Mr. G. I really appreciate it. If you want to connect with Mr. G, I will link to his Twitter in the show notes for this episode out at chrisnessy.com slash 131. Now, to add my thoughts to this, I've tried to use Flipgrid in my classroom this year. I'll be honest, my high school kids hate Flipgrid. They don't like it. They don't want to be on camera like that. They don't want to do it. They don't have the fever. And that's okay. On the other side of the coin... I use it with my students at Rutgers, and they like Flipgrid because they don't like to write. So for them, maybe it's the the point in life that they're at. They don't mind getting on video and talking about their thoughts and expressing their voice that way. Now, back to the high school kids, they're getting into the podcasting. Again, I've got the podcast equipment in my classroom, and they're really getting into that. And I'm really asking them and getting their input on how we can use it in class outside of what I do in the morning with the live morning announcements uh, in a uh, morning radio show format. So there you go. Next up, we have an email I got from Lori Woods. And Lori says, I just listened to your message episode where you talk a little about using Flipgrid. I just started using this amazing tool in my classroom and the students love it. What do other teachers do to manage the noise level in the classroom so the videos can be more easily heard? My students and I have really enjoyed using this tool for formative assessment. However, some of the videos are quite difficult to hear because 26 students are recording simultaneously on their individual devices. I have two self-made recording studios from Crates, but I was wondering if there were any other suggestions for managing Flipgrid and noise levels. So, Laurie, I have two suggestions for you. Number one, If you have the ability to utilize areas of the school outside of your classroom, maybe you can send kids out into the hall 
or into another room where another teacher can kind of supervise them, or if you can be in two places at once, certainly utilize some more physical space. The other option might be to have students record in your homemade studios, but have them record in groups where maybe you're able to do some small group instruction with a portion of the class while other students are able to huddle up around their laptops or their devices and do the Flipgrid assignment. If anybody else has other thoughts, please go to chrisnessy.com slash 131, leave a comment on the show notes, and Lori, that's where you can check for additional uh, feedback as well. Now, if you want to share something that you've done where you want to share for this Just Give It a Try segment, again, go to chrisnessy.com slash flipgrid and choose the Just Give It a Try grid. Post your thoughts there. If you want to reply to somebody that has posted something, you can do that. And I will include audio in future episodes. Thanks for checking out this episode of the House of EdTech podcast. Keep the conversation going. I would love to connect with you and hear your thoughts on my EdTech thought for this episode, the lesson that I shared, or if you have suggestions for uh, Mr. G or Lori Woods, or you want to let me know that you tried out I am creator. I would love to hear your thoughts. Just go to chrisnessy.com slash 131. Now, if you enjoy the podcast, First, I hope you're subscribed. If you haven't hit subscribe yet, please do so. That would be awesome. Also, if you enjoyed the show, tell somebody else about the podcast. Share it on social media. Use the hashtag House of Ed Tech, and let's, let's show the podcast some love. There's lots of podcasts out there getting lots of love on Twitter. Why not the House of Ed Tech? So, let's start tweeting about it, everybody. You could also become an awesome supporter of the podcast. My awesome supporter program is powered by Patreon, and I want to give a special thanks to all of my awesome supporters, which include Anthony Arnaud of the New Teacher Podcast, which you can find at newteacher.org, Eric Kurtz, who now hosts the Control-Alt-Achieve Podcast, which you can find at controlaltachieve.com, Dan Gallagher from gallagertech.edublogs.org, Mr. G, that's right, the Mr. G host of the Aced Tech Podcast, which you can find at aced.tech. Peggy George from Classroom 2.0 Live. Jen Giffen from Shooks and Giff the Podcast, which you can find at bit.ly slash shooks and gif. Jeff Herb, my man, from instructionaltechtalk.com. Mike Messner, at TeacherMike72 on Twitter. JP Presavento, host of the Bits and Bytes of Education Podcast, over on jpprez.com. Lynn Smargis, at Lynn Smargis on Twitter. Scott Titmus at SD Titmus on Twitter. And Kyle Wilcox, at Level Up Ed Tech on Twitter. Thank you to all of you for all your support. If you're interested in becoming an awesome supporter, go to chrisnessy.com slash awesome. The next episode of the House of Ed Tech is going to be episode number 132. That's going to come right at you on April 28th, 2019. At which time, little secret, or not so much anymore, I will then be 38 years old because my birthday is April 27th. Until next time, thank you for learning with me. And remember, using technology isn't difficult. Just give it a try. So I wanted to throw something here at the end real quick. I know a lot of podcasts ask you to leave reviews in Apple Podcasts or iTunes, but wherever you listen, I would love to see a five-star rating and an honest review. If you don't have time, that's okay. Just keep listening. If you're interested in getting a House of Ed Tech sticker for your laptop, go on to Twitter, tweet at me, and say, I'd like a sticker. And then we'll get in touch and I will get you a sticker for your laptop for the House of Ed Tech podcast. Or if you want stickers for a conference or anything like that, let me know 
and I'll be happy to send you a bunch. Talk to you next time.